You're the nurse? Abe. Your accident was when? The car accident was four years ago. October. And your injuries? T11. Complete or incomplete? Incomplete. I still have some feeling. So, so dishes aren't a part of the job description, but, but that is? You never loved anyone, except yourself and your booze. Stephanie called. She said if you show up here, I should call her immediately. Why is that? You didn't tell me. Hi, I'm Emma Smart, one of the BFI Flare programmers, speaking to you from um, my bedroom, which is a first here yes. at BFI Flare, because we're doing BFI Flare at home, our virtual um, festival. And I'm really pleased that this afternoon I am delighted to say that I'm talking to Suzanne Guati, who is the director and writer of T11 Incomplete, which is today's film of the day. And it's a really awesome film actually i was just saying to suzanne that it was one of the earliest picks for this year's flare festival so i'm really glad that we've still been able to bring it to you the audience and that we have suzanne here welcome suzanne thank you emma thanks glad to be here oh it's so great so i'm just going to kind of like open with a with a classic uh, question just to start start us off which is where did the inspiration come from for this really moving and quite complex actually drama there's lots of threads there so where did the idea first come from yeah I, I was thinking about this last night because I wrote it back in 2016 so I think the real um the the origin of it was I just at that time wanted to write a film uh, about disability in some regard I don't think I knew exactly what capacity and about a nurse I, I um, you know, I, I am disabled and I lost my leg about 17 years ago. And the past 20 years of my life, nurses have been such an important um, and valuable uh, inspiration to me getting well. Plus, we had uh, both of my in-laws were on hospice care at my house. So we had hospice nurses here. So I have a ton of nurses in my family. And it was just, uh, I, I, I felt that I wanted to write a nursing story. Again, I had no idea in, in what capacity. And I didn't want to tell my story. So um, just started researching and uh, to try and figure out what kind of, uh, um, you know, what kind of injury the nurse would be dealing with or would she be a hospital nurse. And I started reading and doing a lot of research. And I read about Christopher Reeve and his accident and where his, um, his injury occurred, which was way high up on the on his spinal column. And uh, what I was, what I realized when I was reading, which was just so um, amazing to me was that, of course, the lower you go down the spinal column, the more ability that you have, um, you know, the higher up the injury is, the less you're able to do. Um, but what I didn't know, and I was very naive, was that there's two types of paraplegics. And I, I just assumed if you were paraplegic, you were numb and you couldn't feel, but, what I learned is there's a complete paraplegic and there's an incomplete paraplegic and the incomplete paraplegic still has the ability to feel. And when I read that, it kind of, something just burst open in yeah. me because I thought it was so remarkable because incomplete usually in life is a negative, you know, it's usually you're lacking, but here it's a positive that you still have some ability. So from there, um, I think it just blew wide open for me that the injury was going to be a paraplegic and that I was going to use that metaphor of being incomplete, still having the ability to feel for almost as many characters I, as I could in the piece. So there's Kate and Jack and Elizabeth and everybody who's affected by 
you know, some sort of injury or some sort of um, something that happens in their lives that causes some sort of paralysis, but yet they're still able to, to, you know, because of the resilience of humanity, to work through it and come out the other side with the ability to not be completely numb. So that was pretty much where it all stemmed from. So 2016 then, this has actually been in um, the making for a long time. What's that? What was that process like? Like, obviously, yeah. research and writing would have taken you so far. And then at what point did you know you had a finished screenplay and you wanted to, you know, turn it into into the film? Right. It. Um, I wrote it very quickly, which was um, pretty astonishing. It came out very fast. And then, of course, I do rewrites. But... Um, it took me less time than probably a lot of other things that I've written. Um, from that point, um, you know, I, 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 Karen Silas, who is, plays Kate, is a friend of mine who we did my last film together, Stuff. And um, I gave it to Karen because I had Karen in my mind um, as Kate uh, throughout the whole writing process. So the, the first right. instinct was let Karen look. And mm. when I thought it was, you know, worthy enough of her because she's so okay. fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and to see if it's something she would even be remotely interested in doing. And from there, those, those three, three or three and a half years, I guess, um, was really us working on it quite a bit, uh, talking quite a bit, uh, figuring out who Kate was and, um, I mean, we were doing exercises like she was writing a budget for Kate so she'd know how much money Kate would have. All the little nuance to, you know, I remember I shipped her Kate's shoes because the shoes were such a vital part of the story. Yeah. I wanted her to have the shoes really early so she could walk in them and feel them and all these weird actory things that, you know, <laughs> we were doing. But um, having her there and um, so willing and, and uh, you know, wanting to do this uh, really um, kept me going because of course in this independent world money is always the the, the thing that is never there's never enough of um, yeah. but it, the good thing <laughs> about it was that I got into a lab uh, with this script um, it's in NYWIFT which is New York Women in Film and Television um, back in it was probably like 2017 it was a lab that was almost a year long and uh, this script was picked with a bunch of other women uh, with their scripts, about eight of us, and would meet every Friday night. And we were preparing, um, preparing the film pr for production. And it was a, it's a, it's called From Script to Production. That's the name of the lab. And we read each other's scripts, and we, you know, helped each other with any issues that we saw. But we, at the same time, we were planning budgets, we were planning lookbooks, we were planning all, you know, we were pitching to places and working on our pitch. So it was something that really, when that time, that year had passed, I was so ready in so many regards. Still, money was always, you know, never comes easy, but ready in every other capacity to really get going with it. And then, uh, you know, when another producer came on board, we had enough and we just were able to go, go forward. But it was uh, in that three years, um, I, I think I, I, I feel that I knew the project, you know, you think you write it and you know it so well, but I learned so much more and delved even deeper into it that it was probably the best spent years, you know, rather than just rushing to production, um, I think the film is better because of the time that mm. we took. Yeah, I I think it's it's incredibly accomplished, and it's just it that work it draws you in. I think when I talked about it after I'd seen it for the programming team, and you go back to these meetings, we have these weekly meetings, and you talk about what you've seen, and I just I could only describe it in terms of I just felt so drawn in. I didn't notice the time going. I just wanted to all the different characters. I wanted to figure you know find out how they were going to do at the end as well because some of them you know it doesn't look like they're going to make it kind of thing and it was that thing that you talked about in the beginning that notion of incompleteness and actually how in the end it's an, it's a positive for all of them and and that obviously that time that you took with the film it does pay off on screen 
Um, so it's 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 definitely worth those three years and those labs <laughs> and all the work with with um, Karen. And, um, and actually, speaking of the casting of it, actually, um, you said that you always had Karen in mind for the role of Kate. But what about like the rest of the casting process? And in fact, I think I read that you um, were really determined to involve as many disabled and LGBTQ people in the cast and crew. Which that couldn't have been easy, I imagine. Um, no. that's it, it is. I'm sorry, I cut you off. It is. It wasn't easy, and it took um, again the time that we had was a luxury because um, you know the, 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 it's very tricky. Um, I think the whole disabled um, casting at this point, and being a disabled director, I feel I have a little bit of liberty to to talk about it a little differently. Um, because, um, you know, it's, it's a, a bit of, it's a bit perplexing from this angle too. And I mean, and I'll say, because the first thing Judy Bowman was our casting director who we had, I mean, many, many conversations about how to approach this and do it right and do it well and, um, still serve the story the way it needed to serve with, with the actors and the, our first, um, I guess the first way we went out with it for the role of Laura was um, we, we uh, she put a breakdown out for wheelchair user actor actresses who are wheelchair users. And it is a very small pool, first of all, mm. in here. And um, I did get a handful of um, auditions and, you know, um, I, I just, I needed a, an actress in the wheelchair as and not just a wheelchair user if that makes yeah. sense and I didn't want to you know I, I didn't want to compromise that because um just like I wouldn't compromise putting you know uh I don't know uh, uh as anybody else in a role if they weren't right for the role yeah you, you know if they didn't have yeah, the goods yeah. as an actor for the cool. role just because you're an Italian woman or an Irish you know it ha you have to be the right Irish woman or the right Italian girl, you know? So um, I didn't find what we were looking for there. And I did have, what was really interesting was I did have one particular woman in mind who is a wheelchair user, who's a fine actress. And she didn't even read my script. She wouldn't even read it because she didn't want to play wheelchair user roles. And right. it was perplexing to me that, you know, and then to put, you know, a non-disabled person in a wheelchair mm -hmm. user role is like you get hammered for yeah. that too. Because so it was a very, very difficult way to navigate through this. So after not finding the right actress initially, um, <laughs> kind of looked for actresses who had maybe you know the invisible disabilities, the ones that you can't particularly see, and we came upon uh, Kristen Renton who um, has lupus and is on the lupus ambassador program. And Kate, you know, um, even though it's not a visible disability, it uh, affects her uh, tremendously. And um, yeah, then that's where we started looking mm -hmm. at it. Well, how can we incorporate um, disability in, if it's not exactly the way people will um, expect it to be, how can we get it in in other ways? And that's when we, you know, uh, looked at Katie Sullivan, who plays Elizabeth, yeah. who is a double, uh, bilateral amputee and I don't know if you'd know that by um, seeing wow. the film <laughs> yeah <laughs> I hang on I've just like worked that through wow yeah. okay and so and of course Lauren Russell who um, the real L word which I don't know if yeah. you're familiar with that um, she has MS so you know we tried to do it mm. in other ways without maybe being so on the nose about it yeah. and still let me feel like um, you know the responsibility that I have and I feel greatly Absolutely. Um, I still satisfied it in mm. the way with the disabled community. And we did the same thing with the LGBT community with, um, as we cast Zach in a straight role. Um, yes. you know, he's a very out gay man. Um, and Lauren Russell is also a lesbian, but she sort of plays one there too. But we, yeah. you know, we, uh, tried to be inventive and I have to say it, paid off as well I think uh, besides getting fantastic actors mm. um, I think we sort of satisfied for me and my heart uh, what we needed to to feel um, you know that we did a good job in that area because casting is is just is very tricky because you also have to be um, 
you, know, you have to serve your story and your, mm -hmm. your actors have to be fine, fine actors. And I didn't want to sacrifice that. And I don't think we did. I think we got the, the, gr the greatest actors that um, could have gotten. I think definitely and I think it's a it's a true testament to you though for wanting to represent that way and 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 still you know sticking to that even though you knew there was going to have to perhaps be compromises in certain you know in certain roles and actually I wanted to like when I watched this for the first time I actually thought this is one of the most I suppose realistic representations of disability actually in 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 the central role that I thought wow I don't get to see that and I you know I understand more now and I just yeah I just wanted to say that I've not really got a you. question to follow Thank up you. with but, no we did strive um, for that and um Kristen um had a wonderful coach in LA Lena Strelkoff who is a wheelchair user she's a um a paraplegic and uh, she does TED talk she's just a fantastic right. woman but I hooked Kristen up with her uh, early on and they met um quite often way before we even started production yes. um and she was giving her all kinds of tips on how to move in the chair how to you know how to sit how to how to do everything to to give it that uh realistic look and feel That's and Kristen did a fantastic job yeah, yeah. absolutely everywhere and um just everyone you, you seem to have brought so many incredible performances from actors that I'd seen before in other roles but this really like showcases their skills and I suppose um what was it like then on set? Because um, this is quite a weighty drama, um, lots of threads to it, lots of um, dark themes at times. You know, how did you keep things light on set? Or was it, you know, what was that like? Um, I, I, you know, they're such, they're very light people in, right. in life. Uh, Karen is a, she's a riot, actually. I'd love to write a comedy for her because she is just a funny lady. Uh, <laughs> And and you wouldn't know it, but but she she truly is. And I think you know we were we um, were were careful when uh, the mood required us to really be yeah. all in the same space um, for for scenes like that. Uh, but it was pretty light. Otherwise, Zach is an absolute riot. I don't know if you know Zach. Did he? <laughs> he's been I, to probably the festival with other films. Yeah, he I is don't. one of the funniest <laughs> men on the planet. I think. <laughs> So, um, yeah, whenever he was on set, it was an, everyone was in, yeah. in tears with him. Um, but it was pretty light and people, they're just wonderful people. So, yeah. so it was easy for you then as the director, did you feel, you I, know, yeah, yeah, did you I have fun, you know, did you have fun making it? I don't know. I don't know if any director I've asked that question. I was like, cause yeah. it's a lot. I know it's a lot. to make It is. Film, I think I, I think I tried to have as much yeah. fun as I possibly could. <laughs> sure. And some days definitely were not fun, but. Uh, yeah. Overall, it, it's probably uh, the best experience directing and on set that I've had. Incredible. Yeah. Did I read that actually, um, so the locations, it's, it's all shot on location, right? Right. Um, it's, and it, you use them to great effect. It's, it's, it's um, really good way, wherever you've chose. But did I read that it's Karen's hometown? Did um, I, I'm sure I read some... We it's did. We the, shot at a. Karen is from Long Island, and yeah. originally she's in LA now, um, and she also lives in Brooklyn. But uh, when we shot at the diner, it was on Long Island, um, and I think it wasn't exactly where she was. But I think like there was a connection to the high school that she went to. The <laughs> writer was, was from the yeah. same high school or something like that. But it's all within the same vicinity. So yeah, yeah, we were on our quite... our own uh, our own home home turf. Yeah. So, um, what ha, did you choose it because it was your home turf, and you already knew those that it would work there as a locale for the story? Um, and how long did it actually take you to to film the whole thing? I'm always fascinated by this because I think people, maybe not flair audiences, because they're used to seeing independent film more, perhaps. But I'm always, I always like to ask that question about how how many days were you shooting? How long did this take? Because it often amazes audiences to think that no. you've not had like months and months and months, or maybe no. you did. No, not at all. I, 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 if I remember correctly, um, it was somewhere around 25 days, 25, 26 days, wow. and. Karen, I think, had one day off. Um, I mean, we had, you know, we had a weekend. Yeah. Well, it was kind of scattered. You'd have, sometimes you'd get two in a row. Sometimes would go six and you'd only get one day off. It would really depend on when 
um, places were available, mm -hmm. when the diner was available, when, you know, wherever we were filming was available. But she's, um, cons she's shot consistently. And I, I do believe there was one day that we didn't need her. And she had like an entire day to herself, which was crazy. Um, but uh, as far as... Um, the locations go, we, we just used, and I write like this because I know, you know, I, I know how hard it is to get money because money is what is behind everything in film. It's behind your equipment, it's behind your crew, it's behind your mm -hmm. locations. It is, the, it is what drives making your film uh, going from good to better, your lighting choices, your camera choices, you know? So when I do write something, I write kind of, with in mind what I think I can get, what, what is, what is near me, what is, you know, what is possible for me in my, my mm -hmm. zone that I'm in. So I didn't know the diner, but, um, you know, what we, we, we knew of what was available on Long Island and, you know, for the times that we had to shoot, cause diners usually don't close, you know, they usually 24 hours or they're open very, very late. Mm -hmm. His happened to close at three in the afternoon. So we were able to shoot something in the morning and then shoot to the diner yeah. in the afternoon. So, um, you know, you use what you have. I've mm -hmm. shot at my house, my friend's houses, my mother's <laughs> house, my, you know, my in-laws house. We shot everywhere yeah. that would allow us. Yeah. That's what I always find so fascinating. Talking <laughs> to two directors went at Flair is, is the amount of friends and family, you know, homes that, and yeah. cars and things. And the, that key, are, and the key is oh, that right. we're still friends with them after. <laughs> that right of course <laughs> that is but you still get <laughs> I guess fortunately I still talk to my mother <laughs> <laughs> well that's good to know that's good to know at least you, there wasn't any kind of like massive party scene or no, you know well there, no well there was well, there is a there was but there it was, was the party tame. scene but yeah it was okay yeah, actual, yeah. okay <laughs> that's so fascinating so this is kind of the beginning of, of the journey of this film uh, on on the festival world and, and distribution world. Obviously, we're in a bit of a changed world right now. So probably, um, hopefully you will get in, you know, festivals are going to reopen and, and you will get further. But what are your plans next? Kind of, are you sitting with this film for a, a while longer? Are you already working on, on your next? Which, yeah. Where would you actually, you know what, let me rephrase that, um, thinking on my feet. Um, what what would be kind of the the your ideal outcome for T11 incomplete and see if we can put this out into the, you know, out into the atmosphere of the internet and, and see, you know, where we can end up. Yes. Um, I, well, I think it's, uh, you know, I've never seen a movie like it in our world, <laughs> in our LGBT world. And I think it's um, for being different. I think it deserves to be seen. I think the performance are, are, are fantastic, the performances. And, um, you know, as a disabled writer and director and lesbian, I want movies like mm -hmm. this, you know, these are movies that I would want to see. And there's not a, a heck of a lot of them. Um, so, you know, what I, what I hope for it is that it uh, is well received, of course, when it's out there in the world. I hope that um, a, a beautiful distributor snatches it up and gets it out on as many platforms as it can. I want people to see Karen's work. Mm. I think it's extraordinary. Mm. And um, she should be working constantly in this business. Uh, she's a fantastic actress, as is yeah. Kristen and Zach and little Maxime, who's played Brady. You know, he's he's all over the place. He's in a lot of, uh, he does uh, little guest starring roles on Bull. And so he's he's off and running. <laughs> uh, but there's there's so many great actors in it that deserve, deserve it to be seen for their work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just hope it gets out there and I hope uh, I hope it reaches a lot of people and um, we make a lot of money so that we could put it into our next project and just exactly. keep perpetuating, yeah. perpetuating what we want to do. You know, I have um, I have stuff ready to do. Mm -hmm. I'm writing one now, but there's, you know, I have a script ready, an, uh, a low budget script ready. I have a little um, a mini series um, that's almost ready to go and I, you know, I'm writing something now so I'm constantly doing things it's really Emma it's getting the funds to keep the thing going yeah and, you know we just pray that we get to do another one and then another yeah. one and then another one yeah well I hope so I love your work <laughs> well um, I, thank you for picking it and for seeing its beauty and for um for this you know because uh 
you know, just getting in the festival was a, a major uh, kudos for the film. But, you know, then having that not work out, but having this is is just as good. And I thank you so much. Oh, that's you're very welcome. I didn't do all this. This is, you know, <laughs> I got a phone call saying, can you do this on Saturday? Yeah, I'd love to. When else in a lockdown are you going to meet someone oh. new? all the way over you know the other across side of the world the almost pond, yes. across the pond and have a chat I mean it's kind of unusual and it great is. actually it is. you know there's one last question we um I, I we didn't talk about the cat the amazing oh. just because he's great working he's a with great children, actor he's a, just because we were talking about great actors such, I, I'm just throwing that in there, but yeah, yes, the cat. he was, he was remarkable. His real name is Jack, believe it or not. And <laughs> he had a sibling who, when we went to, it was an animal rescue that we right. borrowed Jack from, but we couldn't take, <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't take just Jack because he had a sibling and he was blind, Jack. And I don't even know if you know that our disability oh even my. went down to our cat. Yes, our choice of kitten. So, so we great. took Jack and Juno. That was his sister. Yeah. And uh, they were both on set. And Jack would do his thing. My daughter was the kitten wrangler. She would bring Jack to set. And um, he actually, he and his sister were both adopted by a, by a lovely little family in New Jersey. Uh, we were going to keep them. Uh, we have two dogs, but I said, if nobody takes them, we will yeah. totally take them, but they got scooped up. So they're doing great and they're big now. <laughs> He's such a big boy. That is so incredible. I love that you actually, yeah, you got a disabled cat to play in, in and yeah. it's such a, yeah. it's such a vital role, actually. <laughs> it is. Because of just what the journey it gives, Kate, you know, Karen's yes. character. Yep. And if, sure. if um, we've, possibly i think we've managed to do this without any big plot spoilers so um definitely people can still watch t11 incomplete today on bfi player and understand why you know jack the cat deserves <laughs> a lot a lot of kudos a lot of kudos um it's been so delightful to speak to you suzanne thank you for making the time um what is it, about midday over where you are probably it is. It's like it's midday and, yeah yeah so you can have the rest of the day now to maybe read all those books that I can see behind you. you you've got a lot of this, I guess, time. time maybe. Now. Yeah, <laughs> not going out so much. So yeah. lots of time to read books. But this has been an absolute delight. Um, thank you, Eddie, to everyone that's been uh, watching this. Do go back to BFI Player. Flare at Home is still running. Um, T11 Incomplete would be a really great way to spend a couple of hours this afternoon and um, keep supporting the arts wherever you can. And um, yeah, thank you, Suzanne. It's been great. Thank you, Emma. I appreciate it. Bye. Bye.